These are NTSB accident identification numbers. A new one is generated roughly 1,500 times a year, about four times a day. In the vast majority, the consequences are relatively mild. An aircraft is damaged. There may be injuries. The situation is regrettable, but people get on with their lives. Sometimes, the price is much higher. We hear about such accidents from time to time, but unless there's a personal connection, they tend to be just another data point in our daily lives, just part of the news. For the people directly involved, though, that one terrible day echoes down through the years and represents a profound break in their lives. In January of 2011, Russ Jeter joined their ranks. He agreed to speak with the Air Safety Institute about his experience and provided funding for this project in hopes of both helping pilots avoid the error he made and reminding them how much is really at stake when they get behind the controls of an aircraft. This is his story. Russ and his family live here in the Pacific Northwest, about 70 miles north of Seattle. This is seaplane country, and recreational opportunities abound for those who enjoy the great outdoors. Uh, my name is Russ Jeter, and I'm a real estate developer, uh, investor at this point in my life. I was a building contractor for many years, and that's uh, when I took up flying. And so with slightly over... 25 years of flying and somewhere in the low 4,000 hours of anything from a Cherokee 180 to a float plane to a jet. Russ is the father of two grown children, and he and his wife Kimberly, also a pilot, have two younger boys, Jacob and Jonah. Jacob, who was with me uh, during the accident, will be eight next week. And Jonah turned six in January. When Jacob was born, uh, he was uh, 21 days old when he first went flying with Kimberly and I. And he and his younger brother Jonah uh, didn't know anything else. Flying was just part of what the family did. By the age of six, Jacob had begun to show a strong interest in outdoor activities, including aviation. From an early age, he was just a robust, um, healthy, smiling, happy little guy. In 2010, July of 2010, uh, Jacob and I um, flew a 206 that had the G1000 panel in it over to Idaho. It was just him and I, so he was sitting in the co-pilot seat. And uh, on the G1000, you could see the icon for the plane and, and our path. And so I said, do you want to fly for a little bit? And you just keep the airplane icon on the path. And I thought in five or 10 minutes, he'll be bored with this and, and want me to switch on the autopilot. But I just thought to myself, remarked to myself that it was an hour before he was ready to relinquish the controls. So uh, he had started to develop an interest and that was the reason that the morning of the accident, he went flying with me. January 22, 2011, dawned clear and calm over northwestern Washington state. Russ and two fellow seaplane pilots, Adam Jones and Steve Verbarnsey, had agreed to go flying as a group that morning. Russ would be in his 1999 Cessna 206, which had been fitted with amphibious floats and converted to turbine power. Uh, we didn't get moving as quickly as I would have liked. Um, I was a little groggy. It didn't seem like I was waking up as quick as I usually do. And I think my, my fellow pilots were, were moving equally slow. So we, we lollygagged before taking off. One of my friends had his airplane uh, parked near mine. And so we went off flying and, and uh, splashed a few places. And then we met the third pilot with his plane over at Arlington. So there was three pilots and a daughter and a wife and my son that were accompanying us. And uh, so we had lunch and discussed what was going on. 
the pilots agreed to do one more landing together on nearby Lake Goodwin. After that, Russ and Jacob would split off from the group and head home. We took off from Arlington in no particular sequence. I just ended up taxiing out last behind the other two guys. Jacob was sitting in the co-pilot seat, and so right after we departed, he said, can I fly? And so I was letting him fly a little bit. When we got closer to Lake Goodwin, he said, can I land? I said, well, no, you can't land, but you can watch what I do and just follow along and, and just pay attention. The lake was not quite glassy, but fairly close to being glassy, so I set up a stabilized uh, approach with a very low um, descent rate. And as I got close to the water, which is not completely obvious in the almost glassy water situation, I felt a little teeny bump, almost like I was landing a little nose down instead of nose up. In a retrospect, I think that was the rear main gear contacting the water and causing a little resistance, so it made me kind of dip a little forward. And just about the time I was going to advance the throttle, the uh, front gear settled down enough to catch the water, and then that sucked uh, the front end down. And before I even had a nanosecond to think about it, the front end sunk and the plane flipped. And um, Jacob, the only thing that I recall, and it's one of those things, did I recall it or was it in my head, screamed Dad. And uh, the next thing I know is the, the plane flipped over, and I can remember seeing the uh, windshield implode. The pilots of the two other aircraft had already taken off and were departing the area when they saw something disturbing on the lake below. I remember looking down and, uh, it's hard for me to talk about it. So I, so I, I looked down, saw a float plane that was upside down. Saw the wheels sticking out of the bottom of the float. Knew instantly. And so I told my, told, told my little girl, I said, that, that, that's Russ. And so my head is underwater, and I am gasping. And I don't know why, but I'm, I, it's the gasping reflex when you're hit with cold water. And so I'm sucking in cold water instead of holding my breath. I couldn't see. And uh, so I kind of calmly thought to myself, well, this is how it ends. I'm trapped upside down inverted, I'm drowning, I'm sucking water in, and in one more breath of water, I'll pass out. And then I thought, oh my God, Kimberly, losing both of us. And um, at that point, as clear as everything is to that point, nothing. I don't know what happened. Um, the next thing I know, I feel my legs, the shins, which were scraped, um, exiting the window on the 206, which levers up. So somehow or another, from inverted and seat belted in drowning, I've got 225 or 30 pounds of me in a wool shirt and a, and a uh, safety vest upside down and through the window, which the hinge broke, skin my legs, and it's the first thing I recall is the scraping of my legs, and then I'm on the surface. By this time, several fishermen had made their way to the submerged aircraft, followed close behind by Russ's fellow pilots. Russ was, uh, had water coming out of his mouth, was uh, coughing, gagging, um, you know, was in tough shape, basically. Um, and the fishermen hollered at me, and they, and they were going, what? And I said, there's a little boy in the plane. Do you have the little boy? So at some point, uh, the fishermen were able to drag me over the side of their boat, because at that point, I was so hypothermic, I 
I couldn't do much of anything. I had tried to take my jacket off because I couldn't dive down because I'd blown up like the, the Goodyear blimp because I was going to try to dive back down, but I couldn't even get my jacket off. It was just me and another guy that were able to, to, to dive down. It seemed like some of the other guys were trying. They were working up on top with the coldness of the water. That's what people don't understand. You know, put you semi like in a state of shock. You're not, you know, you're not firing on all eight cylinders. You had great visibility and great light going down. But when you, you know, went through that window, started looking through the window and went through the window, it was absolutely pitch black in the cabin. Uh, from the moment I hit the water, I could feel it just basically debilitating me. First attempt, I uh, wasn't able to get the door open enough or the window open enough to get in. The second time, I was able to get in, but I wasn't able to get the seatbelt off. A simple chore that anyone would think would be very easy. All of us were in fairly good shape, if not good shape, and we couldn't get the job done. Their rescue efforts having failed, the men tried towing the aircraft ashore, but the submerged tail and propeller hung up on the bottom of the lake, holding the cabin underwater. By this time, I think I was panicking. Somebody at some point said the sheriff diver's getting in the water. He appeared very shortly and I had my son under his arm towed him to shore. Jacob had been in the 38 degree water for more than half an hour. Russ watched in shock as paramedics began resuscitation efforts, praying that the coldness of the water might allow his son to be revived even after the prolonged immersion. He rode along in the ambulance as Jacob was rushed to the hospital. So one of the other pilots had gotten home and, and gotten to our house and uh, told her there'd been an accident and that we were both at the hospital. And so she was en route with a, a lady driving her to the hospital when she got through to me in the emergency room. And I told her to pray that Jacob had 12 people working on him and all we could do was pray. At some point before she got to the hospital, the uh, senior ER doc came over to me and, and he said, well, I have one more call to make and we have a couple of other things we want to try, but uh, there's not been any response. Eventually, the doctors had exhausted their options. Shortly thereafter, Russ's wife, Kimberly, arrived at the hospital. And to this day, I, I don't know how. The first thing she said was, I'm glad you're alive. With superhuman grace and understanding, my wife forgave me. With our son lying there dead, I still don't know to this day how could she how she did that. Alongside his crippling grief over the loss of his son, in the days and weeks following the accident, Russ was haunted by the question of how he could have made such a simple yet consequential mistake. Since I was flying a straight-legged 182 and flying a retractable amphibious float plane and flying a, a retractable jet, I had made it a practice, regardless of how maybe seemingly embarrassing it was, that I did a, a gear undercarriage mixture prop check on everything. The 182 that never had its gear retracted in its life, I always did that check. There was no question what had happened. What Russ wanted to know was why, on that day, he became so distracted that he failed to perform what had become a nearly automatic task. His search for answers led him to Elite Spectrum Consulting, which focuses on human factors in challenging high-risk environments. Human factors uh, refers to those physical and psychological factors that can uh, 
impact worker performance. And he was in a state of distress and trying to better understand what had happened to him. He was given an opportunity to take our human readiness audit. It identifies these areas that may be unknown to the individual that could impact their performance. Russ took the assessment, responding to the questions as he would have prior to the accident. In doing so, one specific event stood out. Um, in March of 2010, just about the time of my mom's uh, 83rd birthday, she was diagnosed with ovarian cancer. In December of 2010, Russ and his family spent Christmas with his mother, and it became apparent that her struggle was nearing an end. In early January, with her condition worsening rapidly, Russ planned to visit her one last time, but events conspired to prevent the trip. And unfortunately, the trip I didn't make uh, resulted in me watching my mom die uh, on the webcams on the afternoon of January 9th. He had lost his mother, I think it was 12 days prior to the, uh, the event. And of course, when one is dealing with uh, life stressors, they impact a number of things. Uh, we become preoccupied, uh, our sleep becomes fitful and disturbed. And it's well known in the literature that it, even when one has restricted sleep, that it impacts their ability to attend and focus and to be able to perform optimally. So between the 9th and uh, about the 20th of January, it's pretty hazy. I had a lot of sleep deprivation, a lot of uh, agony over losing my mom, a lot of grief. Looking back, Russ came to believe that the emotional turmoil and lack of sleep in the days prior to his accident had become a significant impairment, not to his physical flying of the aircraft, but to his ability to maintain focus while interacting with his son. If the annunciator went on that said, uh, gear down for runway landing, I either didn't hear it or was oblivious to it. The truth of the matter is, I didn't look at my fly wire, I didn't notice my lights, and I didn't maintain a sterile cockpit. I was chatting with my son. I hadn't really thought about the death of my, my mother less than two weeks before impairing me. But once I started talking to psychologists, once I started realizing that I'd sent out my mother's obituary the d morning of the accident, once I started thinking about the sleepless nights, I realized that I was unaware that of my impairment. Uh, when people are asked to engage in routine events, they typically can do that without uh, much decrement in their performance. However, it's when events go awry and something novel occurs or something out of the ordinary, that's when the system tends to break down. The distinction between routine and non-routine flight environments was emphasized by the fact that Russ had gone flying by himself in the 206 the day before the accident. It was the first time he'd flown the aircraft in several weeks. The time to have the accident would have been the day before by myself and hadn't flown and hadn't, you know, felt confident or whatever. I mean, I just I hadn't flown for, you know, a little while. Instead, that just gave me a higher sense of confidence that, hey, I'm back in the groove, things are good, weather's nice, let's go fly. Of course, as the thousands of pilots who've made inadvertent gear up landings can attest, one need not be significantly impaired to make the simple mistake of forgetting to flip a switch. All the same, circumstantial evidence and common sense suggest that factors like those that affected Russ Jeter play a significant and often unacknowledged role in many aircraft accidents. Uh, educating people about the importance of their physical health, their psychological health, their nutrition status, their sleep status, these are all critical. I think for the most part people have not recognized that or ignored those factors and it's only when you've been faced with a disaster circumstance or a crisis moment that you appreciate how important those things can be. It, it almost mandates a heightened sense of awareness 
in our training as pilots that we need to have a more sensitive and introspective look at our psychological makeup before flying. Have I been sleeping well? Am I thinking clearly? And I don't think a lot of people, maybe men, are, are as sensitive to that self-analysis. Of course, it's one thing to note that increased self-awareness could help make pilots safer, but quite another to devise a workable means toward that end. Was I feeling a little bit less with it? But, you know, in, in the aftermath of the death of your mother, you expect to feel a little shitty anyway. So where do you, where do you draw the line? It's very difficult for a person to objectively assess their own ability. We can ask someone who's, let's say, an individual who typically will sleep seven to eight hours and for whatever reason may have four hours of sleep. And if we were to ask that individual, how do you feel cognitively? Do you think you're operating at your best? They may and very likely would say, I think I'm doing fine. But in fact, when we run people through uh, any sort of laboratory study, we find that that's not in fact the case. Uh, in fact, there's a considerable literature that says that if you restrict someone to four hours of sleep and give them a series of cognitive tests to take, they perform as does an individual that has had five beers. To help provide a reference point for self-assessment, the FAA and others have relied on devices like the I'm Safe model, which asks pilots to take inventory of their physical and psychological states prior to flying. In general, mnemonics such as I am safe are very, very valuable, and they're important components of creating a culture of safety. Having said that, there are also limitations. Um, the limitation of concern is that whenever one uses a self-appraisal tool, we tend to uh, ignore some of those areas that may be problematic. I, I think pilots tend to be more confident than the average person. I'd like to reach those people that have confidence and it's never going to happen to me um, and have them say, well, just make sure it doesn't because it's nowhere, it's nowhere you want to go. You know, I saw it counseling immediately after the accident because I had never faced anything like this in my, you know, in my life. It was very hard for me not to dwell on particulars of the accident or what if this or what if that. The fact that I made a mistake, you know, resulted in a situation of not only having the sadness and grief of losing my son, but the guilt. One of the things Russ found most troubling was his escape from the submerged cockpit and the fear that the memory loss surrounding the event was somehow tied to a conscious decision to abandon his son. The initial response to cold water immersion uh, results in an inspiratory gasp, hyperventilation, uh, there is tachycardia or racing heart, and there is vasoconstriction, particularly in the peripheral limbs. And that, of course, would immobilize one's ability to manipulate very readily. I was losing control of my arms. I remember that. I remember getting caught in the steps and banging up to the steps and actually ended up through a step and was trying to get, you know, back outside the float. But I could no longer even get my arms above my shoulders anymore. I mean, it was, you're just banging around. That arm, your arms just weren't working. The body is trying to regulate as quickly as possible. And blood is drawn away from the brain during this uh, period of vasoconstriction. And of course, that will impact one's ability to think clearly and think in, in the most uh, uh, attentive way. I've, I've ridden into 206 several times. I couldn't remember for the life of me how the seatbelt latched up and, and what, the, what the door handle configuration was. And I remember everyone's eyes just glossing over and like saying, you know, does anyone have any ideas? And, and looking at everybody, everyone was just shutting down. And so that helped piece together some of the things that really were making me feel guilty about me surviving and Jacob dying.
A lot of people have reached out and there's various things they say that really kind of mean the same thing. It's, it's God's will. It's an accident. No one blames you. It's, it's the state of the humanness of, of us. And I'm trying to wrap my arms around that, but it's not an easy thing to do. And I'm seeking my own forgiveness. Of course, Jacob's death had repercussions that went far beyond his father's personal grief. It's been extraordinarily tough on my wife. She um, doted on him, and conversely, he doted on her. They had a, a beautiful relationship. He was swimming on the little local swim team, of which my wife is, um, is a, uh, a big-time athlete and swimmer, and so he was becoming her mini-me in the swimming pool. Part of the thing in the aftermath of a tragedy is people want to do something. And so a lot of people donated to Jacob's school. And so that money has gone to library books. And then uh, in our local community here, there's several thousand acres of community forest lands. And not all of that is preserved. And the single largest hunk of land that was left was 75 acres. And so friends and family and even some relative strangers have chipped in and preserved that 75 acres in perpetuity in Jacob's honor. And so up on the highest mountain overlooking the forest lands in our community, we put a bench and a plaque that acknowledges that contribution in Jacob's name We recently got a letter from the uh, organ and transplant people informing us that a, a girl with bone cancer had part of Jacob's femur. It's the best of news, and it's the worst of news. It's really good news that we could help somebody, but to think of what's involved and being able to be in the position to help her is a very high price to pay. Following an event like this, many pilots would be reluctant to ever fly again. Russ was apprehensive about returning to the cockpit, but ultimately, for him, the decision hinged on what good would come of such a sacrifice and what would best honor his son's memory. I've always loved flying. It's been a passion. I go to the conventions, I read the magazines. I mean, I love flying. And I chose not to fly for five months after the accident. And I was just maybe terrified of what I might see or what I might imagine. But a funny thing happened after five months I needed to take some recurrency to, to take an FAA check ride or give my pilot's license up. And I had spent too many hours and too much work to get my instrument rating, to get my commercial rating, to get my twin engine rating, to get my ATP rating, to just give that up. And so I had to go. And I went and took some training. I did some flying. And I left the airport and I thought, my son would be proud of me. I didn't give up. I honored his memory. I did something that he and I loved doing together. And I could feel the sense that my son would have been proud of me for getting back in the airplane. More than 100 years ago, Wilbur Wright, the second person ever to fly a powered aircraft, said that someone seeking perfect safety in flying would be best off to sit on a fence and watch the birds. Generations of pilots have understood his meaning, while also doing everything possible to make it safe to get off the fence and into the air. The ability and freedom to fly is a great gift, but one that sometimes comes at great cost. As pilots, we want to share our passion and focus on the positive, which is as it should be. 
But we also do ourselves no favors if we deceive ourselves about what's ultimately at stake and the burden that falls on our shoulders when we take others into the air. By no stretch of the imagination are we healed and we may never, we never, may never be healed. When we're in a good place, we seek to honor His memory. So what I like to do, and the reason I'm doing this safety video, is what would Jacob want? And he would want for us to try to prevent this sort of accident, for us to help others and learn something from the terribly high price that he had to pay.